Is anyone napping? If you're napping, get out from under the table now. Okay, so I would like to thank you for having me here today. I would like to thank the Mi'kmaq people for having us on unceded territory. I'd like to thank the youth for being here and everyone who's here to listen to youth and to work for them and with them and everyone who's tired. And I think probably everyone who's working for HIV and Hep C prevention, working as an advocate, is probably a little bit tired. So thank you for being here. I have two pieces, and I'm actually going to let you choose which piece I'm going to do to get started. And then I'm going to talk a little bit around what it means to use art and art in the knowledge translation process and as a youth engagement tool. So I have one piece that was actually commissioned by Brunswick Street United Church, and it kind of speaks a little bit to the issue of mental health, prisons, criminalization of poverty. And I have another piece that is actually about HIV, but it was commissioned to be an honorary poem for Stephen Lewis when he received an honorary degree. Both of them are all ages, much more PC than I'm used to being, but I'm going to be very polite today. So tell me which poem you want me to do. You want to hear the one about prisons, or you want to hear the one for Stephen Lewis? Prisons. Stephen Lewis. Oh my gosh, we're going to have to have an arm wrestle. The prisons were louder. Okay. She wrote like Emily Dickinson, rhyming verses, tripping from her pen. She slipped quickly from one line to the next. She kept morale up on dark days, when they would come to my poetry class to vent. She hid her name, hoping to cloak an infamous past. Her face never reacted, never revealed, she never cried. And when the tears would come, sprouting from a tender spot within our circle, she would jump up first to stop the spring, gently placing a small bony hand upon the trembling back of a classmate. And when it rained, she wrote about sunshine, intricately outlining every detail of the seashore as if each grain of sand on the, birth, on the beach deserved its own stanza. And when the sun shined, she would come flushed with a plastic glass of water. It would never cheer her up like it did the others who would skip my class to go outside in the sun. And at Christmas, I only saw her open up when I played a Willie Nelson Christmas song and she softly stated that it reminded her of when she was a girl, nostalgia twisting at her like something that was hard to stomach. The tired, pale-faced woman with a portfolio of pink construction paper filled with goopy, cursive writing, each page a Hallmark card tugging up the corners of all of our mouths when she would read aloud from her folder. In our group, we had a lot of hard stories. Some had run away as girls gotten lost in the snow only to be found by the wrong uncle on a snowmobile and shown things they never should have seen as young girls. Some choked themselves through the mouths of bottles, shards breaking off as they crawled into the darkness of the drink, surfacing to realize that they could not get back out and some, well, they could hardly share their story because the meds and the methadone weighed down the lips until all they could do is sit and breathe loudly. But when she shared hers, we were unprepared. So used to her chiming, rhyming couplets about wisdom and friendship. And when she wrote about her nights, lying awake, wishing the windows would open enough to hurl herself out to stop the pain, we did not know what to say. Since she was the one who normally dealt with these situations, we sat silent. Most of the women in my poetry class at the prison, they are gone now, cast out, leaving with nothing but a bus ticket and eyelids bursting with tears. But she's still there. Her sentence was for life. And the sentences that slip so quickly and cheerfully from her pen cannot write away the meds, cannot write away the abuse that she suffered in a world who can only understand sickness in every other organ of the body but the brain. And as the other women come and go through the revolving doors of a criminal justice system, she will be there to see them through their time in maximum security. In the past 10 years, there has been a 100% increase in the number of women with mental illness entering the prison system. Doing what they can to survive on the street, they are now doing time because they had to eat, but here, the punishment for a sick day is segregation. I didn't see her the last time I was there. She wasn't sick. She tried to take her own life, and a few days in solitary confinement was the price. When I left, they told me that when they searched her room, they found stacks of poetry about pain one could only imagine hidden away under her bed. Thank you. So we have about half an hour, and maybe I'll talk really briefly, because I, I really want, I think, 
time for questions and discussion is important at this time of the day. Um, I do want to say that I work primarily with youth. So although I do work with women in prison, I facilitate a poetry and storytelling class at NOAA Institution in uh, both maximum security and medium security. And I also work with women in solitary confinement. I work with youth through the IWK to organize a series of coffee houses. So these are open art nights where youth can come and they can share their art. And we have no agenda for knowledge translation other than to create a stigma-free space. So this, is our, this was our mandate, was to just create space. Because I believe that when you're using art to engage youth, or when you're engaging youth, period, it has to be an ethic of mutual engagement that drives you, right? So you, have, you really have to look eye to eye. And so for us to come to the table with an agenda, we didn't feel we would accomplish the same things or learn the things that we needed to learn from youth in order to even create a knowledge translation agenda to move forward with. So we started running these monthly events at Just Us Coffee House down in Spring Garden Room. And the visual art and the video part of our coffee house is curated by a young artist in residence by the name of Stella Ducklow, who is a youth. She's also a mental health advocate and also someone with first voice experience. So we did our first event with almost no promotion other than Facebook, and it was packed, standing room only. I think we had 80 to 90 people in our first event. And it's grown from there. We don't poster, we don't take out ads in newspapers. All we use is Facebook. And all we do is say that we're going to create a stigma-free space. And then every month, we work together with our Youth Advisory Council at the IWK. We talk about what stigma-free space means. So it's under constant revision. And so for every youth who joins our group that organizes the coffee houses, they have a chance to contribute and say what they feel about what it means to create a stigma-free space. So we always have, uh, we have about an hour before the show where youth come and they can sign up. The event is free. It's all ages. The interesting thing is that we've had a huge age range in who's coming to the shows. So we have families come. We have inpatient youth from the IWK that are in Four South, so in the, the mental health facility there. We have the rec therapist walk them over, and sometimes they come. We have toddlers all the way up to seniors, and we have a ton of teenagers. And the themes that we address are triggering, and they are difficult. And we don't censor other than censor that which would lead to perpetuation of stigma. So they talk about cutting. They talk about suicide. They talk about depression. They talk about their own experiences. They talk about their schools. They can sing. They can play guitar. They can do performance art, belly dancing, whatever they want to do. There's no requirement for it to be political or about mental health in any way. And sometimes youth will come for three or four months, and then all of a sudden they'll just ask to get on the microphone, and they'll have nothing. They'll get up there trembling and say, I have absolutely nothing prepared, but I have something that I just really need to say which I think is a real win because they're feeling like they can engage even though they don't necessarily have the technical skill or the artistic training. So this is my plug for the coffee house model because I believe that it is a really easy thing to organize. It's something that youth can uh, organize themselves. It's something that a lot of businesses in Halifax actually need. So there's a lot of cafes and places downtown that don't get a lot of business on Friday nights. So you can tend to get good leverage for those businesses. Um, yeah, and the ethic of mutual engagement, I think, is something that's important to bring to the table, especially with art, because within the art classroom, we've learned through working with youth over the past year that there's a lot of censorship in the art classroom. So a lot of students feel like it's a free space, and they'll want to talk about something like cutting, or they'll want to talk about something like sexual assault, and the teacher goes to put it up in the hallway, and the principal tells them to take it down. So in October, we had a meeting with the Art Teachers Association of Nova Scotia and found out that in almost every junior high and high school, the art teachers had experiences with censorship when the youth wanted to talk about these kind of you know, stigmatized and taboo topics. So there is a need, I think, for more uh, cultural and performance space for youth because I think if we just support this space, then the issues will come to the table. I said I was going to talk and I rambled for a long time. All right, so um, we have... Half an hour left. I can do the second poem, or I can throw some questions out to you, which would obviously be my preference. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for me, or any requests on how we move forward? Poem. Yeah, you're a poem. Okay, <laughs> we'll negotiate a contract here. I'll do another poem if you all promise to have lots of questions afterwards, or questions for each other around maybe creative approaches to youth engagement. It happens in an instant. Upon entering the body, it makes 
contact beneath the skin, delicate matrix of cells and fluid, soft tissue architecture of our cells, protein binding to receptors. Living pathways interrupted, clipped, wings rendered vulnerable to opportunistic infections. It takes an instant. White noise cancels out rage. Misery becomes as visible as air, but yet our allies, the unwavering critical voice weaving stories into a bigger picture, an ugly landscape that strikes hard to the heart like a small child who walks too much like a grown man, who talks too much like a grown man and carries the weight of a motherless child upon his back. Our allies, the unwavering critical choice to illuminate the dark corners of a world we thought to be round, exposing the large nations growing fat on the meat carved out from the beast of global capital, raking in dividends from structural maladjustment, rendering vulnerable, replicating hunger, and when the Allies' voice speaks, it can happen in an instant. Words strike making contact with viscera, binding deep to who we are, driving into action, impelling soft hands to intertwine this organic architecture safety nets of hands across time just trying to hold water. Before the last grain runs through, grasping hard to each other, like the hands of the women on the Lower East Side near our Pacific tides, rendered vulnerable to opportunistic infections. Replicating, teetering, halfway between death and safety, they have grown too quiet. And the voices of those all struggling to survive remain a whisper beneath the bellies of fat countries full of meat. The child who walks too much like a grown man drowns in the white noise. We do not hear him speak. We need voices with feet and hands on either side, speaking the truth so that hearts beat in banks, calls for justice replicate, so that calls for justice replicate, because it can happen in an instant. Beneath the rippling canvas skyline of Kakuma, or here, it could be anywhere, awoken by a hand placed across her mouth, she cannot breathe as he finishes quickly, and she carries on clipped wings, rendered vulnerable to opportunistic injustices. She goes hungry. There are no natural disasters when scientists have given us protection. There are no plagues when poverty is the vector. There are no natural famines when food goes wasted without thanks. And there are no market forces when hearts beat in banks. There are only human choices. And arising from the ugliness, we must cling to those voices who resonate with the whispers of whose hearts beat in bodies. Virus replicates racing time to call truth. It can, I tell you, happen in an instant.